Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning into this very special episode of the Capital Pores podcast. It's been a while, hasn't it? <laughs> I know I kind of disappeared into the ether, both on the podcast platforms and Twitch and Instagram for a little bit as well. Let's have a quick mental health note because I feel this is important for everyone to hear. The most important thing in your life is yourself. You are what is most important. Taking care of yourself from both a mental and psychological standpoint is important not only for your future, but for your present. Mental health, it's not something to joke about. It's not something to poke fun at or even underestimate. It's a force to be reckoned with. And if you need help, I strongly encourage you to reach out to someone. It is so important to acknowledge within ourselves when something is just not right and you need help fixing it. And I certainly did. I won't get into specifics on this podcast because I consider myself a relatively private person. Plus, you don't need my baggage. What I will tell you is I needed some time away from social media as a whole. I took a break from Instagram, Twitch, the podcast, Facebook, everything. I needed time to get my mental health back in check, not only for myself, but so I could continue to produce a great product of entertainment for all of you. I take great pride in my podcast, and it's a project I intend on continuing for years to come, though I need to make sure each and every episode I release is nothing but my absolute best. And if I can't give that to you, then I won't put anything out. That's the short and sweet of it, but I can assure you, I'm back. <laughs> I've recalibrated, and I'm ready to bring you weekly horror content right here on the Cabin of Horrors podcast. I've also become more active again on Instagram, so if you're looking for daily horror content, head on over there and give me a follow. As for Twitch, that's a whole other bag of worms. <laughs> but you can definitely go follow me on Twitch. I sometimes am on there and uh, we'll get to interact and really hang out live, which is a lot of fun. But if you follow me or Cabin of Horrors on Instagram, you may know that I recently experienced a haunting. And that's something that we're actually going to be talking about right now on this episode of the podcast. And for those of you who aren't aware, I'm about to share the details of what actually happened during that time. So this happened about two to three weeks ago now. I'm not too sure because my concept of time, it's always wacky. It started when my crystals were basically attacked. My girlfriend and I recently moved in together within the last four or five months-ish. She'd lived here for years and years before I moved in and never once experienced any type of paranormal activity. Now my girlfriend decides one day she's going to start cleaning the living room, reorganizing, all that kind of stuff. I'm in the bedroom, which is on the other side of the house, and I hear a loud bang. So I find that my box, which contains my crystals and gems, had just fallen to the floor randomly. No big deal. Whatever. The box only has a pentagram on it, but complete coincidence, that's what I chalked it up to be. Then the next night, I'm casually playing video games with the better half when she looks outside the door and asks the little guy what he wants, our, our son. However, there was no one there. And she had sworn she saw a small child in the door, who she thought was ours, yet he was in his bedroom. Then later that night, my son comes into my room frightened because he saw a woman with long black hair standing by her balcony door, which is maybe about six to eight feet away from his bedroom door. So at this point, having the knowledge that I have, <laughs> I immediately salted the place, got some sage. Then the next morning, the same shelf where my box of crystals had been placed was randomly pulled off the wall out of nowhere. Then a storm started to come in, like a legit storm, like the weather changed as if it was a fucking horror movie. And then that's when things completely spiraled out of control for me. I was totally in my head worried and scared shitless that a legit paranormal event was occurring. And to be honest with you guys, this story is going to have somewhat of a lame ending because nothing really came of it after that. I was going to have someone bless the house, but the activity stopped and it hasn't been back since. My thoughts are it was a spirit who perhaps was traveling through, got stuck. I don't necessarily believe it was malicious, though probably frustrated because it was stuck with a bunch of horror nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I hope that wasn't a huge letdown for everyone, but uh, at the same time, I want to be honest about the situation because I received a ton of hate from people when I first started sharing this experience on Instagram. Though at the same time, there were tons of messages and support and offering ways to help me, which was extremely incredible. And I really appreciate all the positive messages and prayers that all of you had sent my way. Thank you. And to the ones who thought I was making it up for attention or perhaps I was trying to plot something, you can get the fuck out of my community. <laughs> I don't need that kind of negativity in my life, and I refuse to give it a platform, so that's all I'm going to say about that. So now that we're past my real-life story of what I believe to have been a paranormal experience, we're going to dive into a few movies that really struck a chord with me from the paranormal subgenre of horror. See what I did there? These movies are ones that I've watched this year, and I absolutely fell in love with them, and each of them's a low-budget B-movie, and they really deserve more love and attention. So the two movies that we're going to go over on this episode are from the Grave Encounters franchise. 
we'll be talking about the first and second movie and how it became a cult classic in the horror community and also share my thoughts and opinions on how awesome this low budget b movie indie paranormal film is it is such a hidden gem and if you've never seen it I really hope after this episode you go look for it and watch it because you'll, I, you're, you're gonna love it. Grave Encounters is a Canadian found footage movie and it was directed, written, and edited by the Vicious Brothers. It stars a crew of paranormal reality television personalities who are filming an episode inside what is supposedly a haunted psychiatric hospital. <laughs> However, what they shoot ends up being their final episode. Colin Minahan and Stuart Ortiz wrote and directed the film, and their goal was to create a project in the horror genre while maintaining a low budget. To achieve this, they decided to utilize the format of a mockumentary. This turned out to be really the best decision, because at the time, found footage films were seeing huge box office success with the release of Paranormal Activity in 2007. The brothers actually had wondered why no one yet made a found footage film that centered around all these ghost hunting shows you see on TV. And it's a valid question, because when you think about the premise, it seems so basic, yet at the time it hadn't been done yet. The script that was developed for the film, it came out to roughly 85 pages, and it allowed for members of the cast to improvise certain moments during the filming of the movie and they had shot the movie in Riverview Hospital, which is actually a mental institution located in Coquitlam, British Columbia. This hospital served as a location for a number of other television and film productions as well. There were a number of CGI effects utilized throughout the making of the film, which were accomplished quite successfully, in my opinion. Like, I'm not a CGI guy by any means, especially when it comes to my horror movies. I want practical effects at all times. <laughs> Though, if CGI can be done effectively, then it gets a pass from me. There's specifically one sequence in the film that I quite enjoyed, where one of the characters is thrown across a room. And during this scene, it was initially filmed as a practical effect by utilizing a stunt performer being thrown across the room. However, when they were reviewing the footage of the stunt performer being thrown, the Vicious Brothers weren't really happy with the result. So instead, they asked the stunt performer to run, jump, and fall to the ground several times, with the final effect being cleaned up in post-production. And the first time we ever caught a glimpse of Grave Encounters was when a teaser trailer for the movie was first uploaded to YouTube in December of 2010. The trailer immediately went viral, and it got a massive 1.5 million views in just three months. So distribution rights for the film obviously were, were hot, so they were acquired by Tribeca Film, and they had premiered Grave Encounters on April 22nd, 2011 at the Tribeca Film Festival. The film was then released in the United States on August 25th, 2011 in select theaters and video on demand. The total budget of the film was $120,000 and it went on to make a total of $5.4 million at the box office. So obviously it's a big success. There's, there's zero question that this smashed the box office, and I don't really think that anybody expected it to be as successful as it was, which is really the case with a lot of low-budget indie movies when it comes to horror, right? Like, look at Saw. Nobody expected Saw to spawn a franchise like it has now, right? But that first movie, which was a low-budget indie horror movie, spawned a completely new horror franchise and a unique one at that. The story of Grave Encounters begins with Jerry Hartfield, who's the producer of a paranormal reality television show called Grave Encounters, which is directed by a ghost hunter named Lance Preston. Jerry begins to explain that the show Grave Encounters had been cancelled after only five episodes because the crew completely disappeared when filming the sixth episode. He continues to present raw scenes from recovered footage of the sixth and final episode of the show, and this shows us the crew of Lance and occult specialist Sasha Parker, a surveillance operator Matt White, a cameraman T.C. Gibson, and a fake medium named Houston Gray. Now, as campy and corny as these characters sound, it's only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to how campy this movie gets, but in a really good way, I promise, in a really good way. They play up the whole stigma and typical tropes of paranormal investigation shows, which shines a really funny light on the subgenre while setting the stage for the terrifying outcomes that are yet to be seen. The crew of Grave Encounters gets invited to examine the abandoned Collingwood Psychiatric Hospital, where there's been tons of reports of unexplained phenomena for years upon years. So of course, this crew of paranormal investigators needs to get on the case and determine the source of the phenomena. Kenny, who's the hospital's caretaker, ends up being the unlucky guy who uh, takes the crew on a day tour of the hospital. He begins explaining the history of the hospital and focuses on a specific doctor named Arthur Friedkin, who had performed unethical experiments and lobotomies on hospital patients. <laughs> See where this is going. And the doctor eventually met his demise when he was murdered by the hospital patients themselves. So despite all this, the crew decide to lock themselves inside the hospital for the night. 
They begin their investigation inside the hospital and they set up camp near the main entrance. Static cameras are positioned throughout the building as well, and there doesn't appear to be any signs of paranormal activity within the first few. However, TC captures a door slamming behind him, which begins the crew's attempts at contacting the paranormal presence inside the hospital. They begin to hear strange and unexplained sounds when Sasha's hair appears to be lifted into the air by an unseen force. They all return downstairs, pack up their things, and prepare for Kenny's return so they can leave the hospital. Matt makes his way through the hospital alone to try and retrieve the static cameras that they placed everywhere. However, when Matt goes to retrieve the final camera, he ends up hearing a loud banging noise, which he walks off camera to investigate. At this point, neither Matt nor Kenny have returned downstairs with the rest of the crew. So instead of waiting any longer, they decide to force open the front doors of the hospital to get themselves to freedom. However, they're greeted to another hallway that leads them even further into the hospital. So they start aimlessly walking the hallways when they realize their clocks all say that it's now dawn. They look at their watches and their clocks and they see it's supposed to be daytime. Yet it's still dark outside when they look through any of the windows in the hospital. Startling revelation, and despite this, the crew returns to the lobby and decides to grab some sleep when they're awoken by a construction light falling forward and smashing on the ground. TC informs Lance that there's a fire escape on the roof that they can try to get out through, so they head off to find a stairwell with rooftop access. They finally find it, and they see the stairs are blocked off by a wall that seems to have just been randomly built. The corn is real, and I'm seriously here for it. <laughs> so they decide to backtrack and check out a map hanging on the wall. However, when they do, their compass starts spinning in random directions, and the group starts hearing screaming, which they believe to be Matt. So they run through the halls of the hospital trying to find them, and they end up reaching the room where they heard Matt's screams coming from when they find a metal bed frame levitating right in the middle of the air. So of course, they run away in sheer terror, just like any one of us would if we saw a metal bed frame just randomly floating in the air. The crew makes another pit stop to rest, and they find the word hello scratched onto Sasha's back. This starts sending everyone into even more of a panic as they continue to navigate the creepy halls of this haunted hospital. Matt's voice ends up coming through on the walkie-talkie when the group comes across a woman in a hospital gown. And it was up until this point that I actually found the movie somewhat realistic. Like, if it was really legit people who were filming a paranormal reality TV show and ended up in this situation, they most likely would be reacting the same way. However, if I was in this position and saw a random woman wearing a hospital gown, I would not want to be anywhere near them <laughs> whatsoever. Yet this crew seems to have a death wish. They catch up with the woman in the hospital gown and her face completely distorts like she's turning into a demon from the darkest depths of hell. Like, see, see, see what I tell you? Why, why are you going to go attract that? This is why you stay away from creepy women wearing hospital gowns in a haunted asylum. I'm just saying. They of course start running away in sheer fear when Houston gets separated from the rest of the crew members. Houston ends up aimlessly wandering the halls in complete darkness when they're lifted into the air and choked. A bright light bursts from the end of the hallway which then sends Houston flying through the room and effectively killing him on the spot. While this whole thing is going on, Lance, Sasha, and TC have been hiding in a room for several hours now at this point. Somehow, these three now have all been fitted with hospital identification bracelets, which all bear their names respectively. Absolutely super creepy. <laughs> they start roaming the halls again, when an arm smashes through the window and grabs Sasha. Lance ends up freeing her, and they run down the hallway together. Lance starts comforting Sasha when TC yells at them to get in a room where they find Matt sitting there. He's wearing a hospital gown, and has clearly gone insane at this point. While he just sits there in the middle of this room, he starts mumbling incoherently, and he claims that they can all leave the hospital once they're better. What does that mean exactly? I know I wouldn't want to fuck around and find out. <laughs> they decide at this point in their lives, it's time to rest in the room. <laughs> How could they get any rest? I have no clue, but it's a thing apparently. When they wake up, there's several hands reaching through the ceiling and walls, so of course they flee the room but end up in another room, this one full of bathtubs. Matt is also in this room and he's staring down at a bathtub which is full of blood. TC steps in, and he tries to pull Matt away from the bathtub when a figure emerges from the blood and drags TC right into it. It was a totally terrifying scene. It actually got me on a jump scare. I was like, whoa! Like, it was, it was very well done. And Sasha and Lance, they try to save TC by tipping the tub over. Makes complete sense, though TC is nowhere to be found inside the tub. This causes both Sasha and Matt to go into complete hysterics. 
Lance ends up finding an elevator, though struggles with getting the doors open. So he decides to go out alone, leave Sasha and Matt behind so he can find something to try and open the elevator doors with. Lance ends up yanking a rod off a hospital cart he finds when he notices a bloody severed tongue in the corner of the room. A ghostly figure then appears, huddled up in the corner of the ceiling, and begins chasing Lance. <laughs> it's awesome. He ends up leading the figure right to Sasha and Matt because he's not the smartest tool in the shed, and he makes his way back to them, successfully attempts to open the elevator doors. Boom, he gets it open, and he can hear the figure making its way closer to them. So Lance and Sasha try to keep the door closed in an attempt to protect themselves. However, Matt ends up leaning forward a little too much and falls down, falls down the, uh, the elevator shaft. <laughs> oh, I kid you not. Like, I know this movie sounds campy and corny and bad guys, but I'm telling you, if you've never seen Grave Encounters, please, I hope I'm doing it justice because it's so good. It's so good. So Matt falling to his death in an elevator shaft leaves Lance and Sasha to enter the tunnels beneath the building alone in search for an exit. Sasha ends up getting sick and starts coughing up blood violently. So they end up stopping to sleep and Sasha gets abducted by this strange mist. So now <laughs> Lance is all alone by himself and he's wandering the tunnel for several more hours. Lance starts to become more increasingly unstable. He begins feeding off live rats in order to survive and then he passes out again. But when he wakes up, he finds a door. And this leads him straight into Dr. Friedkin's operating room. The same doctor we heard about from the janitor at the beginning of the film. The operating room, it contains evidence of occult rituals, graphic photos from some of the doctor's operations. And Lance sees apparitions of Friedkin and several other nurses as he's dragged away from the camera. The film then ends with a recording of a lobotomized Lance proclaiming that he's now cured and allowed to leave the hospital absolutely awesome movie like i'm telling you guys i don't know if i've stressed that enough but this is a great movie and uh funny story i actually found this film by sheer fluke a hundred percent i'm sure many of you know by now that there's a free streaming service called tubi and i'm not about to advertise to you guys right now just so you know i'm just putting that out there if you haven't checked it out it's truly great it's spelled t-u-b-i tubi it's a catalog of free movies and TV shows, completely legal to watch, and it truly has some of the best underrated horror content out there. I usually will fall asleep to a horror movie or a classic black and white movie on Tubi every night. Reason being is because Tubi, unlike many other streaming services, doesn't actually stop showing you content at a certain point. You know how you're watching Netflix and you'll be like three or four episodes in and it's like, are you still watching? And you're like, fuck off, stop judging me. Tubi doesn't do that. Tubi will keep playing content that's relevant to the last thing that you watched. So it'll literally just keep playing movie after movie after movie until you tell it to stop. So one morning, I'd woken up to Grave Encounters, which was about halfway through. I finished watching it because I was immediately entranced by the movie and how campy it was. So I restarted the movie, ended up watching the entire thing all over again, and absolutely fell in love with it. So much so that I immediately looked it up to see how well it was received. And I was so happy to see that it was actually a cult classic, which had a sequel. I couldn't find the second one anywhere, though. Like, I looked on streaming. I looked on Amazon, Netflix, Tubi, everywhere. I couldn't find it. So I actually bought it. <laughs> I bought it through the Microsoft store on my Xbox and then watched it because I just I had to know if the sequel was any good compared to the first one. So we're going to dive into it right now and talk about the sequel to this awesome low budget film, Grave Encounters 2. Now, unfortunately, there's actually not a lot of info I was able to find online about the behind the scenes of Grave Encounters 2. Part of me feels this may be due to the reception of the film and the fact it absolutely tanked in the eyes of fans. So much so, they actually shelved the third installment, which was set to include the trilogy of these films. However, because the sequel performed so poorly, it was immediately scrapped. So the sequel sees the Vicious Brothers returning to the writer's chair, with John Poloquin sitting behind the director's chair. The sequel is a direct connection to the first film, however only one of the original cast members reprises their role. The story of the sequel follows a group of devoted fans and YouTubers who truly believe that the first Grave Encounters movie was legit. So, you know, interesting concept. So they decide to break into the same psychiatric hospital where the original crew was seen in the first film so they can determine once and for all if the events of the film were real. 
production of the film, it began in late 2011 due to the success of the first film. It was released on October 12th, 2012 with a budget that was much larger than the one they had for the first film. So of course they were really banking on this one to be a success. They had a working budget of $1.4 million for Grave Encounters 2, which is more than 10 times the budget of the first film, which was at $120,000. Unfortunately, it really just wasn't the smash hit success that everyone was hoping for. Personally, I understand why it wasn't such a success like the first film. They really nailed it out of the park with an original concept and a low budget indie feel. When you try to encapsulate that same feeling with a much bigger budget, you're going to come across as trying way too hard, which is definitely the problem with Grave Encounters 2. The plot of the film starts us off with a film student named Alex Wright, and we also see his friends Jennifer, Trevor, Tessa, and Jared. They all decide they're going to produce a documentary film about the original Grave Encounters movie. Everyone with the exception of Alex believes that the first film was a complete work of fiction. However, Alex is far from convinced. He's determined to prove that it, it was real, it was legit. So he starts his investigation by making a plea online for anyone who may have information about the film to contact him. He ends up receiving a message from someone named Death Awaits Six. Creepy enough, right? <laughs> so, so Death Awaits Six leads him to the mother of Sean Rogerson, who was the actor that played Lance in the first Grave Encounters. She believes that Sean's still alive, but it's discovered that she also has dementia and doesn't realize that, you know, her son's actually dead. In an Alex's investigation, he discovers that the entire cast and crew from the first Grave Encounters film are all missing or have been considered dead. The exception to this is the director's The Vicious Brothers, because we find out that they were actually interns of the film's producer Jerry, so their lives were spared since they weren't directly involved with the film. Aha, uh -huh, plot hole fix, I like it, but not good enough. Anyways. <laughs> After this discovery, Alex hunts down the film's producer and ends up meeting Jerry, who confesses to him that the film was legitimately found footage. So they're really trying to push the realism at this point of the franchise, right? Like in this sequel, they're really trying to push that realism factor that they were somewhat able to achieve in the first one, but not really. It's just done in such an unbelievable way that it almost feels forced. So after Alex researches the Collingwood Mental Hospital where the crew were last seen from the found footage film, he discovers it's an abandoned asylum located in British Columbia, Canada. Oh, hi. I'm in BC too. <laughs> so Alex and his merry group of friends decide that they're going to travel there and meet Death Awaits Six, who is the one that really started them on this journey to begin with. Once they've arrived, they discover a Ouija board, <laughs> which is never a good sign. It's even worse when you have a bunch of fucking idiots who find a Ouija board. So they decide it's a great idea to use it and start communicating with spirits. This is where the movie gets even more ridiculous than it already has been, because you find out that Death Awaits 6 is not actually a real person. It's a paranormal entity which turns violent on absolutely everybody. Surprise, surprise, you fucked with a Ouija board and now you're about to find out. So they obviously try to find their way out of this place, but before they do, they're stopped by a security guard. The group and the guard, they start arguing, you know, back and forth with each other. They hear a strange noise. The security guard tells the group, stay where you are. He's going to go investigate the noise. It's going to be big, bad security guard and see what the fuck's up. However, gunshots start being heard once the guard goes off camera. So the group decides to check out whatever the hell happened, and they don't even get to see the security guard anywhere in sight. So at this point, they're changing focus to just finding a way to get the fuck out. So they continue to search for a way out, which results in Jared being violently thrown out of a window, and then Tessa having her head crushed in by an invisible force. The remaining survivors manage to escape the hospital and then get back to their hotel. Once they reach the hotel elevator, it leads them right back to the tunnels beneath the hospital. This was the same place we last saw Lance when he was lobotomized by Dr. Friedkin. That's where the group runs into Rogerson, who was the actor who played Lance in the first Grave Encounters movie. It's discovered that he's been trapped inside the hospital for over nine years now and has been completely lobotomized. Not only that, but he's gone completely insane. And he explains that the hospital is like this because of Dr. Friedkin's satanic experiments and rituals, which had merged the spirit world with the physical world. Yeah, I told you it gets even more ridiculous. We're not even there yet. Keep, stay with me, guys. Stay with so he ends up leading the group to a red door, which he believes is truly the only way out of the hospital. However, the door is wrapped in chains. It's like not even a door attached to a wall where you would open it and walk through something. It's literally a door in the middle of a room wrapped in chains. <laughs> and this guy, anyways, the group ends up finding a chain cutter, which was left in Trevor's tool bag before they decide to get some rest. During this time, Rogerson is now compelled by Dr. Friedkin 
and he ends up killing Trevor, stealing everyone's equipment, and cuts the chains to the door himself. So he walks through the door, only to discover that it leads absolutely nowhere. Of course. <laughs> and these entities of the hospital, they begin to instruct Rogerson to continue the killings that have been going on throughout the film. Alex and Jennifer, they wake up, and they find Friedkin's satanic altar, with him performing a lobotomy, then sacrificing an infant. Like, it's absolutely fucked up at this point. So they run away, and they encounter Rogerson, who ends up demanding that they hand over their tapes to him so that the film can finally be finished. Which now, apparently, is the only way to escape the hospital is to finish the film. So, like, three different plot points out of fucking nowhere. But anyways, uh, the plot just becomes completely convoluted and confusing at this point. And you're not really sure where they're going with it or even what is going on at this point. It's just fucked up. So during the struggle between the group and Rogerson, he ends up being sucked up by a void that opens into the wall. And Alex Alex realizes that Rogerson was actually right and that the only way to escape is to finish the film. So he kills Jennifer, which completes the film. Yep. Yep. I don't even know. But <laughs> so he gets to leave the hospital through the red door and he lands in the outskirts of Los Angeles, where he winds up arrested while walking down the street in the middle of the night. So he transports himself from a hospital in British Columbia to Los Angeles through a red door for apparently no fucking reason, no explanation. And the final scene shows us Alex and Jerry. It's the original producer of Grave Encounters along with Alex. We find out that all the footage that's been made into this film it was completely staged. Both of them are saying that, you know, this wasn't a real movie. It was all just fake, blah, blah, blah. Yet Alex at the same time says not to go anywhere near the hospital because it's not worth it. The film ends, cuts to a black screen with the numbers 49, 14, 122, and 48 appearing on the screen. And if you put these numbers into Google Maps, it actually comes up with the coordinates of Riverview Hospital where most of the film's story takes place. Again, a film that tried way too hard to capitalize on the original concept that it had with the first Grave Encounters film. It had potential, don't get me wrong. Like, it really did. Still a somewhat original premise, right? And it could have turned into something really worthwhile watching. However, the whole thing fell flat between the change of plot halfway through and the terrible direction they decided to take with both the plot and production of the film. It was just destined for disaster. The first Grave Encounters movie, it'll forever remain as one of my favorite found footage movies. I love it. The sequel, not so much. Not a big fan of it. And if you are, great. All the power to you. I don't think it's a bad movie. I would definitely watch it again, but I wouldn't put it side by side with Grave Encounters. Thank you guys again for tuning into this very special paranormal episode of the Cabin of Horrors podcast. I was super excited to review some paranormal movies. I don't think we've actually reviewed a, some, like paranormal movies in general. I think it's all just been slasher movies. I'd have to check. But I think this may be like our first actual paranormal episode, which is pretty cool. I'm excited for it. So thank you guys again for tuning in. Appreciate all the love. Appreciate all the support. I'm going to be coming back to you guys next week. And if you haven't heard yet, because if you're not following me on Twitter, TikTok, or Instagram, or Facebook, you may not know that the month of October is Halloween month. That's right. Every single week, I'm going to be putting out a new podcast episode reviewing the movies in the Halloween franchise. So we're going to start off with the first part, which is going to be Halloween 1 to 3. That's going to be released first. And then we're going to be doing Halloween 4 to 6. Then we're going to be doing Halloween H2O and Halloween Resurrection. Then we're going to be doing for the final episode, Halloween 2018, Halloween Kills, and Halloween Ends. I'm going to be watching it on Peacock on release day, so I will be able to talk about it and fucking rage. I am so excited, guys, for Halloween Ends. I know many of you are too. It's going to be emotional. It's going to be a great end to the Laurie Strode arc. I cannot wait. And if you're like me, I know you can't wait either. And thanks again, guys, for tuning in, and 